Hello and welcome to lecture 15 of Foundations of Artificial Intelligence. Today's lecture is going to cover the basics of probability and then we'll give an introduction to uncertainty with particular emphasis on uncertainty in expert systems. In our last lecture we covered some of the developmental roles for building expert systems. We dove into knowledge acquisition and engineering and then we learned about the Python shell Pike for the development of an expert system and walked through two simple examples of expert systems built with Pike. Today's lecture is going to cover basic probability theory, the concept of statistical inference, we'll cover independence assumptions, likelihood ratios, certainty factors, and finally uncertainty in expert systems. So first off, why do we care about uncertainty? Well, up till now, we focused on deductive reasoning exclusively. In other words, situations where the conclusions are absolute, either true or false. Of course, in many real-world problems, we need a way to conclude that something is probably but not absolutely or necessarily true. For example, some observations, such as symptoms, are usually but not always associated with some cause or some specific disease. This is often true in many applications of expert systems across the field of medicine. Here we simply define uncertainty as the quality or state of being not clearly known. It's this idea of uncertainty that distinguishes deductive knowledge, for instance what we see in mathematics, from inductive belief, which is the foundation of most of science. Just to quickly review, recall how we define deductive reasoning as reasoning from one or more statements to reach a logically certain conclusion. Differently, inductive reasoning reasons from evidence about some members of a class in order to form a conclusion about all members of a class. And we were previously introduced to this idea of a statistical syllogism, where we have some argument where individual premises can have a certainty associated with them, as well as the conclusion. So in this example, 90% of Adirondack trails have water, we have some other premises, and we conclude that it's 90% probable that the Rocky Gap has water. First off, let's talk about some of the sources of uncertainty. First, we'll look at uncertainty of inputs. For example, we could have uncertainty introduced by missing data, having noisy data, or the use of imprecise language. Consider that our natural language is, of course, often ambiguous, and that there can be facts described with terms like often, sometimes, frequently, and hardly ever. Uncertainty in knowledge might result from combining the views of different experts, there being multiple causes that lead to multiple effects, having an incomplete enumeration of conditions or effect, or having an incomplete knowledge of causality in the domain, which might mean that our implications are weakly structured. And then, of course, there's always probabilistic and stochastic effects, or just uncertainty that comes from randomness itself. Uncertainty in outputs can be the result of using abduction and induction as reasoning methods, which are inherently uncertain. Furthermore, the use of default reasoning even in a deductive fashion, also can lead to uncertainty. Further, having incomplete deductive inference can also lead to uncertainty. In artificial intelligence, when we think about uncertainty, we usually begin by trying to quantify the certainty of the information we have. In this example, two separate research studies were conducted asking subjects to subjectively attempt to quantify the level of certainty implied by the use of these different terms. For example, always, very often, usually, often, generally, and so on. And we can see in these two studies that slightly different sets of scores were obtained. Funnily enough, in this first example, always only received an average of 99% out of 100 certainty based on the data collected from these study participants. In this example, we might imagine that we're trying to take raw text and quantify the certainty of information based on the use of some of these terms. And instead of arbitrarily assigning certainty values ourselves, we're surveying a group of subjects to try and understand how people perceive the certainty behind the use of these different terms. At this point, let's dive into what might be a refresher for many of you, where we cover basic probability theory. So first off, probability is the language of uncertainty. And it asks, what is the chance that something will occur? Probability can be expressed mathematically as a numerical index with a range between 0 and 1, where 0 represents an absolute impossibility and 1 represents an absolute certainty. We can also, of course, think of this in terms of percentages from 0 to 100. The notation for writing probabilities often looks like something like this, P of X or the probability of X. So, for example, if we have a fair coin, the probability of tossing a heads or the probability of tossing tails are both equal to 0 0.5. 
It's also possible you might have a slightly biased coin, and you might have the probability of heads being 0.51 and the probability of tails being 0.49. Just to formally review how this would be illustrated mathematically, the probability of success would be the number of successes divided by the number of possible outcomes. Or in this case, the probability of success is the number of successes divided by the total number of successes and failures. And of course, the probability of failure is just the opposite. Notably, when we have two outcomes, the sum of our two probabilities of failure and success should equal one. Now let's look at probability tables. Here we have an example of weather at different days in the year, 200 of which were sunny, 100 cloudy, and 65 rainy. So now we can quantify what is the probability that the weather is sunny, or P sunny. In this case, we have 200 sunny days out of 365, and this would be our probability of sunny. We can use similar notation to represent what is the probability of all different kinds of weather, which would then be listed out individually in a list like this. At this point, we're just looking at the probability of a single outcome. In this case, what is the weather? But now let's start to think about the probability of having multiple outcomes at the same time. Here's where we get into the idea of disjoint probability. This is the likelihood that one of two possible events, A or B, will occur. Another way of putting this is the probability that A equals A or probability that B equals B. Notation generally simplifies this expression to look something like this, the probability that A or B has occurred. To calculate what's called disjoint probability, we use the following equation. The probability of A or B is the probability of A alone plus the probability of B minus the probability that A and B are happening at the same time. We need to subtract the probability of both events happening together so that the overlapping parts aren't counted twice. Here's an illustration of this disjoint probability situation. In this illustration, the yellow box represents 100% probability and the area of A or B alone represents the probability of A or B alone and the unique area included in this shape would be the probability of A or B. The probability of A and B would be represented by this overlapping segment. So in other words, our disjoint probability would be the area of A plus the area of B minus this overlapping spot in the middle. This ensures that that overlapping probability in the center is only counted once. Now let's move on to thinking about mutually exclusive events. These are also known as disjoint events. These are events that have no basic outcomes in common or equivalently, their intersection is the empty set. This happens where you have a situation like this. The probability of A or B is just the sum of probability of A plus probability of B. In other words, there's no overlap. We can see that here in the same illustration of the probability space where the A and B have no overlapping region. We call these two events now mutually exclusive events, as they do not happen at the same time. Next, we have joint probability. This is the likelihood of two events occurring together at the same time. We can use this annotation as shorthand for the joint probability of P and A. It means the same thing as P, A, and B, or the probability of A and B happening at the same time. We can obtain this probability by multiplying the probability of A and the probability B, but only if A and B are independent. Here's another weather example, but now we have two aspects of the weather that we're looking at. There's sunny, cloudy, or rainy versus the temperature. Each of these cells represents a unique combination of either what it's like up in the sky or the temperature. So for example, there were 150 days where it was both hot and sunny. The values within each of these cells represents the joint probability of that event occurring. In this case, we've measured the joint probability directly from the environment and have not had to calculate them. We can calculate the probability that it's rainy by adding the rainy days when it's hot and cold together, giving us this probability. We can do the same for temperature is hot alone, where we add up the 150, 40, and 5 to give us 195 out of 365, or a probability of 0.534. Lastly, we might ask, what is the probability that it was both hot and rainy? And we can see from this table that the probability is 5 over 365, or 0.014. Now we might ask, was this variable and this variable independent from one another? We can test this really quickly by asking if the product of these two individual variables on their own is equal to the joint probability we've observed when we actually collected the data. So in other words, is this times this equal to this? When we check that product, we find that we get a different value from 0 0.014, which tells us that these two variables are not independent from one another. Here's an illustration of the joint probability. In this case, we're asking, what is this overlapping space between A and B? 
Just a reminder, we need to be careful when we think about joint probabilities and how we can calculate them based on our awareness of whether these variables are independent or not. Now let's talk about conditional probability. Here we have a situation where multiple events occur and we can express the probability that one of the events will occur given that the other is assumed to have occurred. First off with conditional probabilities, we are assuming that events are not mutually exclusive. So in other words, there is some overlap. We can denote conditional probability using this syntax, probability of A given B. We can calculate this as being the number of times that both A and B can occur, divided by the number of times that B can occur. Similarly, we can calculate the probability of B given A as the probability of B and A occurring at the same time, divided by the probability of A. Note that if the probability of B and A was ever zero, in other words, they are mutually exclusive, this conditional probability would also be zero. However, note that generally, the probability of A given B does not automatically equal the probability of B given A. So to look at the probability of A given B, we can think of this also as the fraction of B outcomes where A also occurs. Let's go back to our illustration of the probability space and remember that our joint probability lies here, or the probability of both A and B occurring. Our conditional probability A given B is best visualized by this fraction, or the joint probability of A and B divided by the probability of B. And our probability of B given A would look like this, where we again start with our joint probability divided now by the probability of A. And intuitively we can see why these aren't always equal. Describing conditional probability is really a stepping stone to getting to something we're going to use a lot here, which is the Bayes rule or theorem. So we again we have our calculation of a conditional probability or probability of A given B using this equation we've just seen. And of course the similar equation below for probability of B given A. Notably we also know that the joint probability B and A is always going to be equal to the joint probability A and B. The order of the variable doesn't really matter here. Therefore we can also get this same equation below. This allows us to substitute in this expression for this one, giving us the Bayes rule. Here, the Bayes rule is describing a conditional probability, or the probability of A given B, in terms of the conditional probability of B given A, the probability of A, and the probability of B. So now we have a way to describe conditional probabilities without requiring joint probabilities. We'll see later on why this is a very useful simplification. Also, notably, this formula is used extensively to support probabilistic, or in other words, inductive reasoning. Next, we might ask, how do we generalize conditional probabilities to some arbitrary number of events? So far, we've only been dealing with two at a time. This is where the chain rule comes into play. The chain rule relates the joint probabilities of events to conditional probabilities. Or in other words, if we want to know the joint probability of A, B, and C all together at the same time, we can calculate this as the probability of A given B and C times the probability of B given C times the probability of C alone. This specific example can be further generalized as such, where instead of A, B, and C, we're using A1, A2, all the way to AN to represent that there could be any number of events evolved in which we're interested in their probabilities. So in this calculation, we can see the same kind of pattern we did above, only reversed for clarity. So now we have the probability of A1 alone instead of the probability of C, the probability of A2 given A1, similar to this, and the probability of A3 given A1 and A2, similar to this, multiplied further in a similar pattern based on how many events we were looking for in our original joint probability. We can apply this chain rule to extending the Bayes rule into a rather complex looking equation. And this approach can be potentially useful when we can't assume independence, as we'll examine further later. And this approach can also be difficult to use based on what probabilities we're able to gather in the real world ahead of time. As a quick interlude, let's also discuss some other probability terminology. The first is the term prior. This is used to describe some probability of an event alone, or the probability of that event before any other evidence was available to place it in context. Likelihood is also used to describe conditional probabilities, for example, the probability of B given A, or also saying it as, assuming the outcome A, how likely is the evidence B? Then there's the term posterior. This describes the conditional probability of the outcome after knowing the evidence, in this case B, or the probability of A given B. Note that all these terms are relative to A in this case being our target outcome, 
and B being some supporting evidence. And then lastly, we have the term inference, which in this context is deriving unknown probability from known ones. Now let's move on to statistical inference. First, we'll start with inference with the Bayes rule. Here, we wanna compute the probability of a query or some outcome, but that probability is gonna be conditioned on some existing evidence. So for example, in asking what the probability is that we have the outcome flu, we might wanna take into consideration the evidence as to whether or not we have a headache. So imagine we have the rule, if headache, then flu. We can express the probability of this using the probability of flu given that we have a headache. And here's where the Bayes rule comes in, since we have a conditional probability that we wanna understand and calculate. In this case, let's say that we have the following prior knowledge. We know that the prior probability of having a headache is 0.1 or 10% of people, and that the prior probability of having the flu is one in 100 or 1% of people. And let's also assume we have the following conditional probability or the probability of having a headache given that you have a flu is something we've collected through survey information to be about 90% of people. Now we can use Bayes rule to calculate the probability of having the flu given that you have a headache. In this case, in this case, 0.9 comes from our conditional probability here, multiplied by the probability of having the flu alone, and this is all divided by the probability of having a headache, giving us a conditional probability of 0.09, or 9% of people. So what this tells us is that if we know that somebody has a headache, there's only a 9% chance that that headache is the result of having the flu. This is a much smaller chance than the 90% that we saw, which came from the probability of having a headache given that you had the flu. But notably, it's higher than the probability of having the flu in general, which is only 1%. So in this case, that bit of evidence that an individual had a headache raised the probability that that person had the flu from a prior probability of 1% to a new conditional probability of 9%. Now let's look at a classic example of probability inference using the Bayes rule. In this example, we have a bag with two envelopes. One envelope has a red ball worth $100, as well as a black ball and the other envelope just has two black balls. Let's say you're a participant in this game to win $100, and you randomly grabbed an envelope. From that envelope, you randomly took out one ball and discovered that it was black. At this point, as a player of the game trying to win $100, should you switch to the other envelope for another draw, or do you stick with the envelope you already drew a ball from? Take a quick moment to pause this video and see if you can get the right answer. Let's walk through how to calculate the best choice in this example problem. Let's start off by defining our variables. We'll use the variable E to represent an envelope, where envelope 1 has a red and black ball, and envelope 2 has the two black balls. In truth, we don't know the underlying states of both envelopes, but we're going to assign them these values just for the purposes of demonstrating how this problem would work out. We also have a variable B that describes the event of drawing a black ball. We know that our prior probability of drawing a black ball is three out of four, since three out of the four balls are black. We can also calculate the conditional probability of drawing a black ball from either envelope. So for example, the probability of drawing a black ball, given that we have envelope one, is 50-50, since envelope one contains both a red and black ball, and the probability of drawing a black ball from envelope two is 100%, or one our probability of having picked one envelope or the other will assume is 50-50. So the prior probability that you pick E1 and the prior probability that you pick E2 are both 0.5. Next, we wanna work out what's the probability that you picked envelope X given that you drew a black ball. We'll write this as follows. Probability of E of X given B, or the probability you drew a black ball. Here we use the Bayes rule to give us these variables with which to try and calculate this probability. So next, we wanna calculate this for both the situation where you have envelope one or envelope two and compare them. So first, what's the probability that we drew envelope one given that we drew a black ball? Based on the Bayes rule, we'd calculate this to be one third. Differently, what's the probability we drew envelope two given that we drew a black ball? In this case, we would get two out of three. Therefore, the likelihood is greater that you picked envelope two with two black balls in it given that you drew a black ball in your first attempt. This can be counterintuitive, as you might expect in your first draw that you had a one out of four chance of picking the red ball, and in your second draw, you now had a one out of three chance of picking a red ball. However, the evidence that in your first attempt you drew a black ball does alter the probabilities. 
Therefore, the better strategy is to switch to the other envelope and take your chances that you'll pull a red ball. Of course, this strategy is not certain, we're dealing with probabilities, but on average, in this scenario, if you drew a black ball in the first attempt, your odds of picking a red ball in the second are better if you switch envelopes. This example that we just walked through is very similar to the classic Monty Hall problem, where contestants have to pick a prize behind different doors. This is a really interesting video on YouTube that really breaks this problem down piece by piece, and I definitely recommend that you check it out. So next we might ask, why do we bother with the Bayes rule when we're building an expert system? Or why do we make things this complicated? Why not just calculate the probability of having the flu, given that an individual has a headache, from the data directly in order to use in an expert system? Well, at the end of the day, it often comes out to the accessibility of that data. Patients that clinicians can easily observe in their clinic will usually be identified as having a given disease, ultimately. Otherwise, they probably wouldn't have been in the clinic to begin with. So from these patients, we can easily get the probability of symptoms. For example, the probability of a headache given the disease flu. But how is it practical to gather up all people with headaches and then survey how many of them have the flu? In diagnosis problems, we often have available data on probabilities of various symptoms of different diseases. For example, the prior probability of having a headache. So with these two kinds of probabilities, you can go ahead and calculate this original probability that we're interested in using the Bayes rule. You might also reasonably ask, why not calculate this target probability that we're interested in using the joint probability of flu and headaches divided by the probability of headaches rather than, again, the Bayes rule? Well, the joint probability, probability of F and H, can also be difficult to gather data on. Here you'd need to build a joint probability table which in certain problems might be possible, but it's potentially very impractical as the scale of a problem gets bigger. At the end of the day, when it comes to uncertainty and reasoning and probabilities, you're gonna to wanna to work with the data that's most feasible to collect, as well as the data that's most reliably collected. Now let's look at a couple of more slightly advanced things that we can do with the Bayes rule. For example, what if we don't have available data on symptom probability, or in other words, probability of B? Well, if the occurrence of an event A depends on only two mutually exclusive events, B and not B, we obtain the alternative way to calculate probability of B. Or in other words, the probability of B given A times the probability of A, plus the probability of B given that we don't have A times the probability that we don't have A. We can then substitute this equation into the Bayes rule, giving us the following. So now in the dividend of this equation, the probability of B is replaced by this whole expression we see above. Notably, the probability of not A is the prior probability of hypothesis A being false. So perhaps it's the probability of not having a headache. Basically, we show this manipulation to illustrate how when some pieces of evidence or probabilities aren't available or can't be easily calculated, there are often alternative ways to calculate them based on available information. Also of note here, the probability of B given not A is the probability of finding evidence B even when hypothesis A is false. Next, let's shift gears into thinking about the impact of independence assumptions in these probability calculations. We start thinking about independence when we have a situation where we want to reason with multiple pieces of evidence. But before we can do this, we need to understand which bits of evidence are independent from others. As we mentioned earlier, two facts, let's say E1 and E2, are independent of each other if and only if they have no influence on each other. To put this again formally, two events, A and B, are independent if their joint probability is the product of their individual probabilities, as we saw earlier, or the probability of A does not change given the evidence B. Or in this case, the probability of A conditional on B is equivalent to just the probability of A alone. Further, the probability of B does not change given A, or the probability of B given A is just equal to the probability of B. If all three of these things are satisfied, you know that A and B are independent of one another. The independence of variables itself is some important domain knowledge to have on a problem. If in this example A and B are independent, then the joint probability table between them can be calculated really simply and will ultimately just have k to the two cells, where k is the number of variables you have. Before diving into situations where independence is not satisfied, let's look how the assumption of independence could be misused in calculating probabilities. 
So here we have an anecdote of a famous statistician who had never traveled by airplane because he had studied air travel and estimated that the probability of there being a bomb on any given flight was one in a million, and he was not prepared to accept those odds. One day, a colleague met him at a conference far from home and said, how did you get here, by train? And the statistician said, no, I flew. His colleague asked, what about the possibility of a bomb? And the statistician said, well, I began thinking that if the odds of one bomb are one in a million, then the odds of two bombs are one in a million times one in a million. This is a very, very small probability, which he thought he could accept. So now he brings his own bomb along. Of course, the humor in this anecdote is derived from the misuse of the independence assumption. Here, the statistician failed to recognize that there was dependency between the evidence of intending to use the bomb and the presence of a bomb. So in this story, the original odds of a bomb having been brought on the airplane remain at the original one in a million, despite the fact that the statistician brought his own. Next, let's talk about the concept of conditional independence. Notably, random variables can be dependent, yet conditionally independent. As an example, imagine your house has an alarm, and your neighbor John will call when he hears the alarm. You also have a neighbor Mary that will call when she hears the alarm. But we assume that John and Mary don't talk to each other. So in this case, is John's calling independent of Mary's calling? The answer here is no. If John called, likely the alarm went off, which increases the probability that Mary will call. Or another way of putting this, the probability of Mary calling, given that John called, is not equal to just Mary calling alone. However, if we know the status of the alarm, then the probability of John calling shouldn't affect Mary calling at all. So in this case, the probability of Mary calling, given that the alarm sounded and John called, is the same as the probability of Mary calling just given that the alarm sounded. So in this example, we can say that John calling and Mary calling are conditionally independent given that the alarm went off. Another way of phrasing this is that those two variables are independent, conditioned on whether the alarm went off or not. In general, A and B are conditionally independent given C if the following situations are true. The probability of A given B and C is equal to the probability of A given just C, or the probability of B given A and C is equal to the probability of B given C, or the joint probability of A and B given C is equal to the probability of A given C times the probability of B given C. So all of these equations represent situations where you can check the conditional independence between variables. Now let's talk about how conditional independence comes into play in practice. For diagnostic tasks, we're interested in the conditional independence of a collection of bits of evidence, which we'll call E1 through N here, given some hypothesis H. This assumption is often made even when the data can't be collected to confirm it, and this is for a number of practical reasons. Specifically, this allows us to dramatically simplify probabilistic reasoning by reducing the number of data we need to collect in order to calculate anything. In practice, we can make this assumption of conditional independence where it seems appropriate to the phenomena being modeled. At the end of the day, we have to use common sense and educated guess to put forward this assumption of conditional independence. As an example, imagine we're looking at pneumonia as a hypothesis. We might expect a causal relationship between the presence of pneumonia and a positive findings on a chest x-ray, as well as the presence of pneumonia and the presence of a cough. Therefore, once it's known that pneumonia is present, the probability of a positive x-ray will likely be the same whether or not a cough is present. Thus, it's reasonable here to assume that a positive x-ray and a cough are conditionally independent given pneumonia. If we allow ourselves to assume conditional independence or we check that it is actually true, then we can get the following for Bayes' rules. So here we have the probability of some hypothesis given a collection of bits of evidence. We can use the Bayes' rule form to rewrite this equation to be calculated as such. First, we can write it like this, where we have the probability of jointly having all these pieces of evidence, given the hypothesis, times the prior probability of the hypothesis, divided by the joint probability of all evidences. This can be further rewritten as such, where we have the conditional probability of each piece of evidence, given the hypothesis, all multiplied by one another, as well as multiplied by the prior probability of the hypothesis. This again is divided by the joint probability of all pieces of evidence. 
using this equation is much simpler than if we had to rely on the chain rule we learned earlier, where recall that the chain rule can be used even when we can't assume independence. But in order to use these equations, we still need to know the joint probability of all symptoms, as we can see here in the denominator. However, we can do a similar manipulation of the Bayes rule if the possible hypotheses are exhaustive as well as mutually exclusive. Or in other words, if everyone has one of the diseases, but no more than one. In this situation, we can manipulate the Bayes rule to look like this, where we're trying to understand the probability of a hypothesis given these pieces of evidence as being equal to this expression. Now let's take a quick look at reasoning with multiple hypotheses. So in this case, we're trying to take into account both multiple hypotheses, let's say H1 through HM, and multiple pieces of evidence, E1 through EN. Here, the hypotheses, as well as all the evidences, must be mutually exclusive and exhaustive. But in this case, we're back to a lack of assumption of conditional independence. First, let's look at the equation for dealing with a single piece of evidence and multiple hypotheses. Differently, we have the following equation for dealing with multiple pieces of evidences as well as multiple hypotheses. But as you can see, this gets to be somewhat of a complex mess. The use of the equations on the last slide required us to obtain the conditional probabilities of all possible combinations of evidences for all hypotheses. And this can place an enormous burden on the expert or the researcher that's trying to gather the data. Therefore, conditional independence among different evidences are assumed in a way that's hopefully upheld by the data. But, and in this case, we can use this equation filled with a number of conditional probabilities that generally would be easier to calculate. In other words, the probability of evidence one given a hypothesis. This equation is what would most commonly be applied in expert systems that rely on a more formal probabilistic framework for calculating uncertainty. So next we're gonna transition into thinking about ranking potentially true hypotheses given different bits of evidence. So let's examine this simple example where we have an expert who's given three conditionally independent evidences, E1, 2, and 3 and they create three mutually exclusive and exhaustive hypotheses, H1, H2, and H3. Furthermore, they provide prior probabilities for all of these hypotheses. In other words, the probability of H1, H2, and H3, respectively. The expert also determines the conditional probabilities of observing each evidence for all possible hypotheses. This is all captured in this table here. So here at the top, we have our three hypotheses, I1, 2, and 3. Along this column, we have different probabilities. So the prior probability of a given hypothesis, the probability of evidence one given that hypothesis, the probability of evidence two given that hypothesis, and the probability of evidence three given that hypothesis. So for example, the probability that you'd see evidence three given that you have disease three is 90%. So in this example, let's say that we first observe evidence three and the expert system now computes the posterior probabilities for all hypotheses. So here we're applying that aforementioned equation where we are assuming conditional independence and we have three hypotheses for I. Therefore, we have the probability of each hypothesis given that we have evidence three. Here are those three calculations, one for each of the hypotheses. Recall that before we knew any of this evidence, our prior probabilities of any one of these hypothesis outcomes are listed here in this row, with hypothesis one being the most likely. After calculating the conditional probabilities of these hypotheses given evidence three, we can now see that hypothesis one and two are now equally likely and hypothesis three is least. Now let's suppose we now get evidence one in addition to evidence three. So again, we're gonna calculate these posterior probabilities using this equation. Now where we have two pieces of evidence to consider. Now we look at the updated conditional probabilities for each of the hypotheses and find that hypothesis two is now much more likely than the other two hypotheses. Now let's say we finally get evidence two and we wanna calculate our final posterior probabilities for all hypotheses. Here again is our conditional probability equation for each hypothesis given all three pieces of evidence and we see the following calculated probabilities for each. Where now with the introduction of evidence two, the probability of hypothesis two has completely gone away. And we find with the addition, and we find that by including all three pieces of evidence, that hypothesis three is now the most probable. This is despite hypothesis three originally having had the lowest 
prior probability. The next couple sections of this lecture are going to now start to talk about some simplifications dealing with probability and uncertainty as they begin to be applied in expert systems and real world problems. First we're going to talk about likelihood ratios. So Bayes theorem can be awkward for diagnostic problems. Thus it's often reformulated using what are called likelihood ratios. They're often written like this, which say the odds of H, a hypothesis, are equal to the probability of the hypothesis divided by one minus the probability of that hypothesis. This is just like odds on horses, where the odds of Speedy the horse winning might be three to two. Or in other words, there are three chances of him winning to two chances of him not winning. Odds like three to two or 1.5 on a disease means that three people will have it for every two that don't. Then there's posterior odds. This is related to conditional probabilities. Here we have the odds of a hypothesis given evidence, which can be calculated as such, where we have the probability of a hypothesis given the evidence divided by one minus that probability. So here we might want to know that the odds of a person having a disease is five to two, given that they have a fever. Now let's talk about positive likelihood ratio. This is also known as the level of sufficiency, abbreviated as LS. With the level of sufficiency, we want to consider how adequate some evidence E is for concluding H. LS is calculated here as the probability that we see the evidence given our hypothesis, divided by the probability of the evidence given that we did not see that hypothesis. Now we can rewrite the posterior odds, or the odds of the hypothesis given the evidence, in terms of this level of sufficiency, times the odds of the hypothesis itself, where the odds of a hypothesis are simply the probability of the hypothesis divided by one minus that probability. We can also use posterior odds with multiple evidences. Again, assuming conditional independence, we can multiply together each level of sufficiency for each bit of evidence. Then we can multiply the result by the prior odds. So let's take a look at an example. Here we have two hypotheses of either measles or mumps and included are their LS values given pieces of evidence. You could think of these values as the odds that you'd see that evidence given that they have the target outcome. So here spots are more indicative of measles than they are of mumps. Let's say that in this situation we also know that the odds of having measles are 0.1 and the odds of having mumps are 0.05. So now given that a patient has spots but no temperature, what are the odds of having either measles or mumps? Well, we can calculate this using that equation from our last slide, where our odds of measles, given no spots and no temp, takes the, LS of measles, takes the LS of spots, no temperature, and multiplies them by the prior odds of the hypotheses, measles. So in this case, 15 times 0.8 times 0.1 gives us an odds of 1.2. We can similarly calculate this for mumps, where we have 10 for spots, 0.7 for no temperature, and a prior odds of 0 0.05, giving us a final odds of 0.35. So in this case, given those two pieces of evidence, spots and no temperature, we know that the probability or the odds of having measles is quite a bit greater. Having just talked about odds, let's quickly revisit Bayes, where the framework for Bayesian reasoning requires probability values as the primary inputs. You could start with patient data to determine the likelihood ratios and prior odds of different diseases. And if data wasn't available, an expert could make an educated guess. However, of course, there are many potential sources of error. For one, the symptoms may not be independent given the disease. The likelihood ratios and prior odds may be inaccurate based on non-representative or overly small samples of patients or poor guesses on the part of experts. Often, simple systems that deal with uncertainty may give it the illusion of precision. For example, they could output a high probability for a given outcome, such as 96%, but there could be critical errors behind these values if the system wasn't set up correctly or the assumptions that went behind the probability calculations were not satisfied. Further, if we don't make assumptions about the conditional independence of these variables, we would need huge tables of conditional probabilities. So for example, What's the probability of each hypothesis for every single unique combination of evidence possible? Typically doing this just isn't practical. So for example, given 16 possible symptoms, we'd need a table with two to the power of 16 or over 65,000 entries for every disease. 
It's unlikely that we'd have enough data on past patients to get accurate probabilities for each. So the message here is that the performance of Bayesian statistical reasoning systems deteriorates as a larger number of diseases and symptoms are considered. And this is primarily due to the violation of conditional independence that we've discussed. Next, let's talk briefly about certainty factors. This is a big simplification. These offer a popular alternative to Bayesian reasoning. They're effectively just a number that measures the expert's belief. Where the maximum value of a certainty factor is, say, positive 1, or definitely true, and the minimum value might be negative 1, or definitely false. For example, if the expert states that some evidence is almost certainly true, a certainty factor value of 0.8 could be assigned to this evidence. Importantly, certainty factors are not the same as probabilities, but of course they're conceptually and intuitively related. We'll learn more about the Mycin expert system in our next lecture, but for now, here is how certainty factors are used by that expert system that quantify the level of expert certainty in different facts in the rule base, ranging from definitely or positive 1 to definitely not or negative 1. In expert systems that use certainty factors, the knowledge base consists of a set of rules that have the following syntax. If, evidence, then hypothesis, with an associated certainty factor. Again, this certainty factor represents a belief in the hypothesis given that the evidence has occurred. Let's dive a little further into certainty factor theory. This is based on two functions. The first is measure of belief, or MBH and E, which is the measure of increased belief in H due to E. There's also the measure of disbelief, or MD, in this case HE, which measures the increased disbelief in H due to the evidence E. Here's how both of these could be calculated. So here, the measure of belief in this hypothesis given the evidence E can be a perfect one if in this example the probability of that hypothesis is always true given the evidence. Otherwise, we could calculate it using maximums for our measure of belief and minimums for our measure of disbelief. Here, P of H is the prior probability of hypothesis H being true, and we have the conditional probability P H given E is the probability that hypothesis H is true given evidence E. So these values of measure of belief and measure of disbelief are ranged between 0 and 1. The strength of belief or disbelief in hypothesis H depends on the kind of evidence E observed. Some facts may increase the strength of belief, but some might increase the strength of disbelief. The total strength of belief or disbelief in a hypothesis is represented as the certainty factor calculated by this equation, where the measure of belief in hypothesis given E minus the measure of disbelief in hypothesis given E divided by 1 minus the minimum of the measure of belief HE or the measure of disbelief HE. Notably, these certainty factor calculations are a lot more mathematically simple. So let's walk through an example of using certainty factors. Imagine we have a simple rule as follows. If A is X, then B is Y. An expert may not be absolutely certain that this rule holds. Also, suppose it's been observed that in some cases, even when the if part of the rule is satisfied and the object A takes on a value X, object B can acquire some different value Z. So here we have if A is X, then B is Y with a certainty factor of 0.7, or B is Z with a certainty factor of 0.2. We've now looked at certainty factors within individual rules at a time, but as we know from our discussion of rules so far, they often work in concert with one another. So now we want to start to look at how certainty gets propagated as one rule triggers another. These certainty factors assigned to rules get propagated through the reasoning chain. This involves establishing the net certainty of the rule consequent when the evidence in the rule antecedent is uncertain. So in other words, there can even be certainty factors associated with the if components of rules. Or in other words, our confidence in the hypothesis being true, given some piece of evidence, is equal to the confidence we have in that evidence to begin with. This is multiplied by the confidence we have in that hypothesis, given that we have some evidence. So again, another simple example, if we have the rule, if sky is clear, then the forecast is sunny, with a confidence factor of 0.8. And let's also say that our current confidence factor of the fact sky is clear is only 50%, then our confidence in the conclusion H, given the evidence E, is this 0.5, which is the confidence in our evidence, times 0.8, the confidence in this rule association. 
yielding a total confidence factor of 0.4 for this conclusion. This result can be qualitatively interpreted as it may be sunny. Now let's look at certainty factors in conjunctive rules, or rules with a number of ands in between the evidence bits. The certainty of hypothesis H is established as follows, where the certainty of the hypothesis, given all pieces of evidence, is the minimum of the certainty factors behind each piece of evidence. For example, if the sky is clear and the forecast is sunny, then the action is to wear sunglasses with a confidence factor of 0.8. If the confidence of sky is clear is 0.9 and the confidence of forecast of sunny is 0.7, then we can conclude the confidence of our hypothesis given these two pieces of evidence to be 0.56, where we take the minimum of our evidence certainties and multiply it by our rules confidence factor. We can also consider certainty factors in disjunctive rules or rules where the evidence is separated by an or. Here, the certainty of the hypothesis is established using a similar equation, but now we have the maximum of certainty values used by each piece of evidence. So going back to this similar example, if the sky is overcast or the forecast is rain, then the action is to take an umbrella with a confidence factor of 0.9. Now let's assume that we have confidence factors of 0.6 and 0.8 for our two pieces of evidence. So our calculation of the confidence factor behind the hypothesis given these two pieces of evidence is calculated as the maximum of our confidence factor in these two pieces of evidence, which would be 0.8, times the confidence factor of our rule, which is 0.9, giving us a final value of 0.72 as our confidence factor. How about situations where the antecedents of two rules are identical to one another? So let's say in this situation that the same consequent is obtained as a result of two or more of these rules firing at once. Here, the individual certainty factors of these rules must be merged to give a combined certainty factor for a hypothesis. You can kind of think of this as multiple rules triggering and contributing together to vote on the certainty of the final outcome. So suppose your knowledge base consisted of the following two rules. Rule one is if A is X, and rule two is then C is Z with this confidence, and rule two is if B is Y, then C is Z with this confidence. Common sense suggests that if we have two pieces of evidence from different sources, in this case rule one and rule two, and they support the same hypothesis, in this case that C is Z, then the confidence in the hypothesis should increase and become stronger than if only one piece of evidence had been obtained. So we can combine certainty factors when multiple rules trigger using the following equation. When both certainty factors are positive, then the new certainty factor is just the sum of the two multiply by one minus the first certainty factor. If both of the certainty factors are below zero, we can again add them together and multiply them by one plus the, the first certainty factor. If one is positive and one is negative, then we can use this equation. In these equations, CF1 is the confidence in hypothesis H established by rule one. CF2 is the confidence in hypothesis H established by rule two. And these two are the absolute magnitudes of the confidence factors one and two. Stepping back and looking at the difference between Bayesian reasoning and certainty factors, let's just mention a few items. First, probability theory is the oldest and best established technique to deal with inexact knowledge and random data. It works well in areas like forecasting and planning where statistical data is usually available and accurate probability statements can be made. The Bayesian belief propagation is of exponential complexity and thus it's impractical for large knowledge bases. On the other hand, the certainty theory is not mathematically pure, but it does mimic the thinking process of a human expert. Using certainty factors tends to outperform subjective Bayesian reasoning in such areas as diagnostics. Certainty factors are used in cases where the probabilities are not known or are too difficult or expensive to obtain. And certainty factors evidential reasoning mechanisms can manage incrementally acquired evidence, the conjunction and disjunction of hypotheses, as well as evidences with different degrees of belief. The certainty factor approach also provides better explanations of the control flow through a rule-based expert system. So at the end of the day, Bayesian reasoning is more accurate and more mathematically correct, and certainty factors are easier to use, interpret, and better mimic the way humans think, whether that's right or wrong. We'll end this lecture talking a bit more about uncertainty in expert systems.
First off, in expert systems, the probabilities required to solve a problem will need to be provided by experts. An expert will determine the prior probabilities for possible hypotheses, in other words, pH and p not h, and also the conditional probabilities for observing evidence if the hypothesis is true, such as the probability of evidence given the hypothesis, and if the hypothesis is false, in other words, the probability of the evidence given that the hypothesis is not true. Users of the expert system will provide information about the evidence observed, and the expert system therefore computes the probability of a hypothesis given the evidence for the hypothesis H in light of the user supplied evidence E. Briefly, there are two main genres of expert systems. Simpler expert systems are known as monotonic expert systems. Rule-based expert systems primarily use monotonic logic, so they can't retract conclusions. Here's a famous example where monotonic logic fails to work very well. In 1982, Marvin Minsky gave the following example. First, a human indicates that all ducks can fly and that Charlie is a duck. The expert system reasons that Charlie can fly. Then the human adds that Charlie is now dead. So now the expert system needs to be able to change its conclusion and reason that Charlie can no longer fly. Monotonic expert systems can't learn any knowledge that contradicts with what's already known. Or in other words, it can never replace a statement with its negation. Therefore, the knowledge base only grows new facts in a monotonic, one-directional fashion. Two advantages of these monotonic expert systems is that they greatly simplify truth maintenance, and there's a greater diversity of learning strategies that you can use with these systems. In contrast, non-monotonic expert systems can learn knowledge that contradicts what's already known. It does this by replacing old knowledge with new knowledge. The advantage here is that there is increased applicability to real-world domains and a greater freedom to learn new things. These are much harder to build, but there are now a few systems built on non-monotonic logics. We've talked about a few ways to think about uncertainty today in the context of probability and expert systems, but there are some other ways to represent uncertainty. One of these is default reasoning. Here we have non-monotonic logic that allows the retraction of default beliefs if they prove to be false. Then there's evidential reasoning. This is exemplified by the dempster schaefer theory, where you have bell P is a measure of the evidence for P, and bell not P is a measure of the evidence against P, and together they can define a belief interval, or an upper and lower bounds of confidence. Then there's fuzzy reasoning, which we've touched on earlier, where a fuzzy set can describe how well does an object satisfy a vague property, and fuzzy logic asks how true is a logical statement. And lastly, Bayesian networks, which we'll cover in our uncertainty module later in this course. Let's look at some of the trade-offs regarding some of these different ways to represent uncertainty. When we're dealing with probability or Bayes strategies, the inference process can be highly complex, but you do get quantitative measures of uncertainty. When it comes to certainty factors, they're not semantically well-founded, rules have to be independent, and certainty factors have to be available. However, certainty factors allow for rule-based inference, and they're much simpler than dealing with probabilities. With non-monotonic logic, you can represent common sense reasoning, but it can be computationally very, very expensive. Going back to the dempster schaefer theory, this is another strategy that has some nice formal properties, but can also be complex and computationally expensive. Furthermore, the intervals of confidence tend to grow towards all the way from zero to one, which doesn't give you a very useful conclusion. Then there's fuzzy reasoning, where the semantics themselves are super unclear, right? They're fuzzy to begin with. And also you get these longer inference chains that become problematic. However, fuzzy reasoning systems are easy to design, they have intuitive rules, and they can be useful for some commercial applications. And finally, with Bayesian networks, they offer nice theoretical properties combined with efficient reasoning, and this has made them very popular. But they have a limited expressiveness, and they often introduce knowledge engineering challenges that can limit their uses. In general, when it comes to representation of uncertainty, there's a general trade-off between computational complexity versus representational power and precision of those probabilities and uncertainty. In today's lecture, we've covered the basics of probability theory. We talked about statistical inference with focus on the Bayes rule. We discussed independence assumptions, including conditional independence, 
and reasoning with multiple evidences or hypotheses. Then we moved into likelihood ratios, learning about posterior odds, level of sufficiency, and some of the issues with Bayesian approaches. Next, we discussed certainty factors, their use in expert systems, their calculation, and their propagation through rule chains. And finally, we had a little bit of a discussion about uncertainty in expert systems as a whole. Here's today's quote, the probability of success is difficult to estimate, but if we never search, the chance of success is zero. Just a reminder, assignment three will be due soon. Please check your syllabus for specific dates. As always, thank you for your attention, and I'll see you in the next lecture.